there. I do have to say, as the weather gets warmer, we always compete with the weather. And um, But do want to also let you know that we have people watching it from the live stream. So I want to welcome all those people um, as well. And one of the great things about the streaming opportunity is that people can view it over uh, several weeks and we know that they do that. So um, again, uh, my name is Ellen and this lecture series is the Joan M. Kelly C-State Lecture Series. Um, we put this on just about every month and uh, really work to shed light on some of the work that we're doing here at GMRI, as well as important work that's related to what we do, have to put in, uh, happening out in the community. Um, I think most of you know GMRI, but for those of you who are newer to us, our mission is that we pioneer collaborative solutions to global ocean challenges. And that means um, that we're very aspirational, we're um, very committed to the Gulf of Maine, yet the problems we're working on here are pertinent to the whole world. And um, we work hard to learn from elsewhere and to share what we're learning. Um, a big part of our focus in these days is um, the changing Gulf of Maine. And um, you may have heard that the Gulf of Maine is changing faster than 99% of the world's oceans. And um, that's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. So we're working hard to understand everything we can out um, in the Gulf and be able to translate that to others that um, are working on both the, uh, the marine economy as well as the ecosystem. We, have, we do science research, a lot of community engagement, and science education primarily for middle schoolers. Um, we bring in 10,000 middle schoolers into this space every year to have a half day experience uh, doing authentic research related to what our scientists are working on. So a whole lot going on here, um, and we really enjoy um, having the older public, meaning not middle schoolers, but older being older than middle schoolers, come in for this state lecture. Um, so this series has been about women who are changing the state. And these two women are unbelievable examples of that. And they happen to be two people that um, we work with very closely in our sustainable seafood program, which is really one of um, our, our real flagship programs. Um, Lee Chase is the seafood category manager at Hannaford. She's worked there for 28 years. And what she's most passionate is about influencing the industry to do the right thing, and um, that's really played out in seafood, which you're gonna hear about. Kim Gray is the director of Center Store Merchandising. Um, she's been in the grocery industry 20 years, uh, more, more shorter at Hannaford, but she's gonna let you know what that, that path was, um, and has really um, also a, a deep passion for sustainable seafood and has been an incredible partner to us here at GMRI. Um, Hannaford Supermarkets is way bigger than what we see on Forest Avenue. Um, I know that I have my favorite store and I, it's sometimes easy to forget how many others there are, but there are actually 188 stores. Come on in. Um, in the Northeast, including Maine, New, New York, <coughs> Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont, and employs more than 27,000 associates, which is an incredible thing. So um, these two are gonna talk to you about their sustainable seafood story. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce Kim Gray and Lee Chase. Thank you, Ellen. And thank you to everyone for being here with us this evening. I know it's time out of your busy schedules and you're missing a beautiful evening, so thank you. I'm Kim Gray. I am the current center store director. I'm in charge of category management, merchandising, and pricing for Hannaford Banner. I'm one of three directors that manage center store, and center for store is really uh, non-perishable or dry grocery. Just to tell you a little bit about my journey, I started in 1998 with Food Lion, which was our sister company down in North Carolina. So if you hear a little accent, <laughs> it's, it's real. 
Uh, I started in 98 as a health and beauty care buyer and had five and a half years in Center Store, which what Center Store did for me was really build a, a solid foundation for me to learn grocery and grocery retailing. I, at 27, 28 years old, I got pregnant and had a baby. And I think as a female with a career, I had a crossroad in my life very early on to make a decision what I'm going to do. I was very successful, I was very career driven, but there was nothing like holding that 8.2 pound baby and <laughs> saying, who, who do I want to raise this child? And I had the best situation and I had my parents taking care of them when I was working, but I did choose to leave the organization for six years and, and raise him and have his sister while I was gone. And, and that was a very important and a kind of a unique situation that I think women face more than men. I re-entered the Food Lion organization in about six years later. And shortly after I entered the organization, I joined the meat and seafood department. Uh, I was the first female category manager ever at Food Lion. So you can only imagine the dynamics of the team. They were a bunch of meat cutters and people, men, that grew up in the meat business. And I, I would say I rocked the world a little bit. <laughs> um, one of our leaders made a comment to me, and I, I remember it to this day. He says, I don't know what I like about you. I don't know if I like your science or the fact that you're a woman. <laughs> like, hmm. Um, well, I shared with him that my science is probably because I'm a woman. But that he, I, I liked it because he recognized that I was different and that that was okay and that was actually a benefit to the department. So we keep fast forwarding it. I stayed in meat and seafood with the organization for seven years. Um, three years ago, we decentralized category management and I moved to, to Maine, and that's how I ended up here. And I stood up our meat and seafood department here in the corporate office in a, a brand new team, which was a, a very neat journey within itself. Just recently, um, seven months ago, I wanted a new um, career path and to continue just to grow and develop. So that's how I've landed back in Center Store to kind of round me out as a larger organization. Uh, so that's a little bit about me and my career path. Lee's going to share hers in just a minute, and then after that we'll get into the organization and then how we got into seafood sustainability and that journey. So, Lee. Okay. Thank you, Kim. So my name is Lee Chase, and I am currently a meat and seafood category manager for Hannaford. And my journey was a little different than Kim. So I actually, 28 years ago, applied for a position at, at that time it was uh, Shop and Save. And I uh, had an opportunity to either work as a front end cashier or meat in the meat department as a meat wrapper. I chose meat wrapper at that time because it was the highest paid department in the store. <laughs> and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my, with my life at that point. So I said, this will just uh, take up some time until I decide you know, what my career path is going to look like. So after working in the meat department for a couple of months, I was approached by my meat manager at the time. And you have to remember this was back um, in the 90s, or it was early 90 and, um, 90s. And my meat manager said, you know, Lee, you, um, you have some really awesome leadership skills. And you should think about applying to the bakery where women became, become managers. And I looked at him and I said, <coughs> I think in his own way he's complimenting me, but I, and I'm going to take it as a compliment. But I said to him, I said, you know what? I think I want to be a meat manager. And he, he looked at me, he's like, women don't become meat managers. <laughs> they are only rappers. And I'm like, well, what I've learned in my couple of months here, us meat rappers are actually really running the department, so I think I can be a meat manager. So, and I, I share that story because it, it was a different way of thinking back then, but... Um, so once I asked the question, I had support from the, the leadership in the store, and I did become a meat manager and quickly developed a passion for meat. And so I filled a lot of different roles as a, some sort of a leader in the meat industry throughout Hannaford and um, spent a lot of my career in our stores and then was always c considered the, the meat resource. So eventually someone, um, I won't say who, but she's standing next to me, convinced me that I should think about 
buying for seafood. And so I thought, well, okay, um, I'm a meat manager, was a meat manager, worked in the meat industry, and, and um, how hard can seafood be? <laughs> Boy, <laughs> so my eyes were wide open after the first couple of months in that role. But I think what really has helped me prepare me for this, this role that I'm in now is back in the 90s, what I learned about the meat department, there were a lot, we were learning a lot more about food safety. There were regulation changes happening and a lot of the meat managers were very resistant about those changes. But I was able to work with them, influence them to do the right thing. So I quickly developed a passion around doing the right thing in the organization and that's really helped prepare me for this role in seafood. So it, it's, it's a journey that I continue to take and, um, and continue to have passion around. Thank you, Lee. Just wanted to share a little bit about who Hannaford is and how we plug into a much larger organization. In 2016, we merged with All Hold Del Hayes. So it was the Food Lion Legacy Del Hayes America plus the AUSA brands. And we are a 62 billion euro organization with over 375,000 associates. And we actually service 50 million customers throughout the world, over 11 countries. Uh, so as you can tell, we are um, a very, very large organization, but Hannaford acts small. And I'm gonna try to drill all the way down to Hannaford in a second. So on the East Coast, we are the um, largest grocery retailer with our sister and brother banners or brands, um, as you can see on the board. We have over two in, 220,000 associates and over 2,000 stores. And All Hold Del Hayes um, has continued the journey of sustainable retailing. Del Hayes America, which is where we grew up, uh, has always had a huge passion about sustainable retailing, and that's where a lot of the story comes from. But our, we merged with a company that it was very important to as well, and we'll continue this journey together. So here's our current areas of focus and some pretty, um, you know, stretch goals to get to in 2020. So it's promote healthier eating, reduce food waste, and we care in, immensely about our associates. So it's to create healthy and inclusive workplaces. And there's just a lot of things that we do within the organization to bring these to life and we're very committed to them. So Hannaford, Hannaford is the grocery store you all know. We have over 180 corporate stores in five um, states in the Northeast. Uh, we serve, uh, or we have about 25,000 associates our stores are small. We have as small as stores as 11,000 square feet all the way up to over 80,000 square foot stores. Some of our stores do a million dollars a week and some do $150,000, $200,000 a week. So we, we have a pretty broad spectrum of how we deliver to our customer. So now I'm gonna talk um, a little bit about Hannaford specifically. So, and I wanted to just share a little bit about our strategy. So the Hannaford strategy really focuses on bringing the full shop experience um, to, our, to our customers. And we bring these experiences to life in a lot of different ways. So primarily we focus on fresh, local, healthy, being priced right, and great customer service. And specifically speaking to seafood and how we support our strategy, is we really pride ourselves on providing fresh, high quality seafood in our seafood departments. We have a wide variety of healthy and local items that you can find throughout our seafood department and, uh, and in our stores. And those items are um, highlighted with local ident or uh, guiding stars, so it really makes it easier for our, our customers to shop our case and make those decisions as they, as they see fit. And then um, priced right. We really try to be priced right, uh, be competitively priced, and make healthy living affordable. Uh, and then great, great service and how we deliver that great uh, customer experience when you shop our seafood store is through a, a couple of different ways. We really pride ourselves on associate training. So we try to arm our associates with lots of information that's gonna help answer consumers' questions as they shop our um, uh, seafood departments 
And then it, um, we have lots of marketing messages available in the, the department that really highlight a lot of the answers to the questions that we most oft often we, um, receive from our, from our consumers. So in this next picture, um, this next slide, I wanted to show uh, everyone different ways that we merchandise our store, um, seafood in different stores, different formats, as Kim alluded to earlier. We have stores that range from 11K to 80K. And um, so we obviously, we, can, we, we continue to focus on high quality, have great um, specifications that we hold our suppliers accountable to. And, but we have different vehicles that we merchandise the product uh, in each of our stores. So we have ice cases, iceless cases, or case ready programs. But what I really wanted to emphasize is that even though they're displayed differently, it's all high quality product that can be consistently found in all of our stores and delivered in a very quick and timely manner. And most of the seafood arrives um, from from harvest to store within a 48 time, um, time frame, which a lot of customers are not aware of that. Okay. So when I was in Lee's role for Del Hayes America, so I had Hannaford and Food Lion, there was a gentleman that called me up. I was a few months into my role as a seafood category manager. His name's George Parminter. He happens to be with us today. He's up there in the white suit. George, would you like to stand up? <laughs> <laughs> he would. George knocked on, or actually gave me a phone call. I think he even made the trip all the way to North Carolina to talk to me in person. And he's like, Kim, we have a problem. And I'm like, no, we don't. <laughs> I got plenty of seafood. I got great retails. We don't have any problems. He's like, yeah, we do. And he shared some, st some statistics with me. This is what he shared with me, and it was 2009. He said 87% of our seafood that we're selling is either fully exploited or, or working on being exploited. And that was hard to choke. But I was a buyer, and I was a seller of seafood, and I knew that with any type of change that he was talking about to me, my costs could go up. Nobody had sustainable seafood or, or tried to sell me sustainable seafood, so I figured my costs will go up or I won't have enough supply. I bought a lot of seafood, especially shrimp, salmon, cod. I had it up here. I said, we bought a lot of seafood. And I told George, I'm like, go home. <laughs> you know, leave me alone. I've got to, I'm running this business. You're, you know, the sustainability guy. <laughs> I'm sure he remembers that conversation. <laughs> so with that, he said, oh, by the way, your category is hitting the headlines in a big, big way. And you're going to get caught in the crossfire if you don't do something about this and you don't partner with me. Well, he, he was nice, to, he was always nice to me, but we, were, we had social responsibility issues going on. And I will say I'm not the only buyer in the United States that, was, that didn't want to accept this. I, we were running a business, but the more information he shared with me, and it didn't take long, I came around and said, yes, absolutely. We have a responsibility because you all, all of us as customers, trust me, not to sell you the last piece of salmon on the planet Earth. You don't expect me to buy product that we're destroying the ecosystem. You don't want shrimp that was peeled by children or slave labor. You trust me or my team who's making those purchasing decisions to do the right thing. And that's why I could start sleeping at night because I knew that we were gonna start making policies and holding suppliers accountable um, to bring a seafood sustainability policy to Delhaze America, to our suppliers, and to our communities to service our customers better. So, and this was all kind of new news at that time. This was something I had no idea, um, but we needed to face. So what did we do? We went and looked for a partner. We found a partner, and it was GMRI. And we're very lucky that we found GMRI. Um, Jen's in the room as well. She, she and George and I um, developed a policy 
um, with really this organization's expertise because I, I certainly wasn't an expert in it, which the policy should look like, and then we executed it. And it was really the three of us spending many, many hours, and I'm saying hour after hour. We had over a 1,000 item, items to vet through this policy. We had well over 100 vendors. And it was one phone call at a time. It was a blanket letter saying, here's our deadlines, this is what we need, and then nobody did anything. Mm -hmm. Nobody did anything, it was quite, well, I'm not saying nobody. <coughs> Few people did, the majority did not. And it, got, it took the three of us sitting in a conference room hour after hour making phone call after phone call to the point to where we were going to start discontinuing items. It was a two year process of doing this. We had, I would say, 80 to 90 percent by the end of the first year, year and a half, and then there were those hard ones at the end to really get on board, and those were the conversations that I said, you're either going to get on board or you won't be supplying us. We have a deadline of 2012, we are going to tell our customers we are sustainable, and you will be with us or you, you will not, and you gotta make that decision, that's your decision at this point. There were suppliers we walked away from, and there were items that we could not get vetted through the policy because they simply were not sustainable. Um, so in 2012, after lots of hard work, we um, did announce it to our customers that we were fully sustainable according to our policy. And, um, and I feel like we've made such great, even continued that journey, we didn't stop there. The social c compliance piece, which we're not gonna touch base on too much today, um, came kind of parallel with that. And we've been extremely focused on that since that 2012 mark when we got the, the actual resource sustainable. So I did want to share our actual definition, more of a formal definition. It is on our website of sustainable seafood, and it's seafood products that are caught or farmed in a manner that ensures supply for future generations and minimizes the impact on the ecosystems. Policies, a page, so you can read it at your leisure, but it's the most robust policy in the United States. And we have third party experts that um, make sure that we're doing what we say we're doing and that what our suppliers are saying they're doing. So it's a validated process as well. Thank you, Kim. So Kim's shared the journey that's led us to where we are today as far as the development of our sustainable policy. So what I wanna talk to you now about is the criteria that our um, suppliers are expected to meet to be considered a sustainable um, partner to Hannaford. So the one thing that I would stress um, first and foremost is that all the seafood that we buy must be sourced um, in a responsible manner. So seafood cannot be harvested with any illegal methods and there are illegal methods out there such as dynamite or poison and that's unacceptable for us. Also, um, methods that um, will harm the environment or the ecosystem, as Kim has said, uh, that's definitely something that we, we um, take very seriously. Also, um, all the, the seafood that we source must be uh, from a well-managed fishery. And that's why we have all the seafood that we bring into our store vetted by our science partners here at GMRI. So when I talk about all the seafood, I'm talking about not only what we sell in our seafood cases, I'm talking about what's, what you can find in the center store aisle, like the fish sticks, or what you can find in the deli department for sushi. So, um, so what you're seeing up here on this slide is the criteria and the certifications that our suppliers must meet to um, be a uh, partner to Hannaford. And um, so these are, what we use for the vetting process and then trace register is the platform we use to capture all the um, information from source to shelf so to speak and uh, you know at the end of the day we want to be fully transparent to our consumers as well as traceable that's very important to us and we hold our suppliers to uh, accountable to these measures and these these expectations so um, and it's really important for us to to have accountability because we work so hard to build and maintain trust with our customers. And having accountability is just one of those ways that we establish trust. So um, when we 
we, so some of the other commitments that our suppliers have to, to um, make is we actually have them sign um, a confident seafood agreement, which is a lot of um, verbiage around being a good, you know, having this, sharing the same ethics that we have, and it speaks to sustainability, social compliancy, which is extremely important to us and becoming even more important as we learn more about things that are happening out there. And then food safety, that's all point of entry if, if folks want to do business with, with Hannaford. So, yeah, so that's really a little bit about the criteria. And then um, what I wanted to talk about next is, you know, we're, we're consistently looking at ways to improve sustainability um, for the products that we source for our seafood department. And some of those examples of um, improvement that we, we look at are, um, you know, for if there's an opportunity for us to participate in a fishery improvement project, or if there's a way we can reduce our co carbon footprint, or maybe improve um, best practices for, um, for cold chain purposes, or even looking at packaging so that we have a more sustainable packaging. So again, those are just a lot of examples that we're constantly, constantly looking at and, and reviewing with our supplier community. And you know, an example of another example of how we um, support these improvement um, plans. We we actually participated in a um, fishery improvement project uh, several years ago. We we actually identified an issue um, with the Jonah crab fishery. We we recognized that it wasn't well managed, and so we got together with our science partners, our supplier community, and we said, hey, we. We're, we're not feeling good about this, this fishery and don't feel that it's well managed. So a lot of work happened and um, I, I will say I wasn't at the table at the time, but I've learned a lot about it and it's led to um, future opportunities for us. But what I did learn about that work was that, um, that you can be successful when you bring a bunch of people together to improve you know, identified opportunity and that happened. Um, recommendations were made, they were accepted, and um, you know we're we're feeling good about what's happening in that fishery. And what I would also like to uh, highlight about about that effort was we made a commitment to our um, supplier partners during that um, project, and we we really appreciated their willingness to sit at a table and talk about how we can improve this. Um, fishery because there was some impacts in their business um, by by changing the way they are doing things, and we um, so we made the commitment that you know what we will not source any Jonah crab from anyone who is not supporting this effort, and that's an approach that we take today with all of um, seafood that we we source that we when we know or are made aware of a fishery improvement project um, related to that fishery then. Um, will only buy from the suppliers who are supporting that effort. And there's, there's a lot of them out there, which um, makes me proud that we have suppliers who are willing to come forward and, and do the right thing. So um, here we have some lovely pictures of uh, some, some folks in this room. Um, and the reason why we we thought we'd share some pitches is we really wanted to emphasize that we work really hard to build and maintain relationships with our supplier community. So we uh, we want to make sure that expectations, goals, priorities are clear, and that our we're aligned to do what's most important for our business. So we've traveled all around the world to visit with our suppliers. We don't do business with anyone we have not visited to make sure that they're meeting our criteria. So as you can see, some look like they're nice places. Some aren't so glamorous. Um, we get to wear really cool outfits sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, at the end of the day, what we really wanted to share is that we're out there on at, you know, visiting suppliers, seeing what's going on out there. And, you know, it's my team last year, um, my team and, and Kyle from GMRI, we, 
We travel from Maine to New York to visit all of our local suppliers just to share um, you know, best practices, expectations of one another, and so we're continuing to work with the supplier community to, to really just find ways that we can grow our seafood sales. And I'll say we had some pretty interesting visits. We sat at some of our fishermen's kitchen tables to have some conversations, or we even sat in living rooms, but everyone was very welcoming, and um, we feel really good about the people that we, we partner with. This is just a few more pictures of actual Asia when, in some of our trips, I think between Lee and myself and her peer at Food Lion, we've probably been to 10 or 11 countries in the last seven years, um, and some multiple times. So we also go to conferences where we learn of issues and we work together and collaboratively with other major retailers and or some of our um, science partners like for farm seafood and things like that. So um, it's, this, this is, pictures of um, shrimp farms, um, very well organized, very well maintained. Lee and I have seen enough that we can tell kind of what level of um, certifications they've had. These are all passing our certifications um, because they have um, different aeration and they proper drying techniques after they're harvested. Um, there is nothing wrong with farm seafood if it's harvested and grown properly. It's actually a very, very sustainable resource for us. And we take pride in the, in the ponds that we actually grow out of. We know where every single lot is, what pond number it comes out of. It's all in that trace tool. And we do audits against that and make sure that we are getting sustainable product. Um, I was trying to dig up a picture, but it's been several years since I've been to, um, I can't remember if it's Indonesia or Thailand. And I had the supplier I was with stop. I said, I wanted a picture of that. <laughs> no, I can't find it. But um, it was a picture of a pond, and there was cattle grazing around, and there were geese and uh, you know, there were things around it. And it was all going and run off into this pond. And that, I knew it wasn't a pond that we bought from, but I just wanted an example of what it means to buy from a, a BAP two-star pond and what it's, what I could be getting if it wasn't. And I always ask that question, is it, is it at least BAP two star? <laughs> because if not, I don't want to, I don't want to eat it. Mm -hmm. But um, all of our product is, and we fully vet it. But I did, I think it's interesting if you've never seen these type of pictures to see these pictures of, um, these are actual trip pictures from our mm -hmm. visits. Also the plants, just to touch down on that for a second, these plants in Asia are pristine. I mean, I would eat off of the floor. They are so clean. Um, they clipped my fingernails before I went in that you go through vacu like vacuum cleaners <laughs> and it's amazing that uh, what they do and I've been in a lot of plants in the US and our plants in the US are awesome as well but I think when you think of Asia you think of third world countries and you don't think that they're up to speed but these plants really are I'm always impressed every time I go I, th I feel like they go over and above um, what they what they have to even to make the audit scores that they make I think one thing I would share too is, as we talk about you know a lot of these site visits and accountability that um, we have in place, Hannaford takes a lot of steps to make sure that we're providing high quality product to to our customers. And and I think a lot of folks don't know we we do random DNA testing, so we make sure that they're not adding certain you know more so solutions or any solutions, um, and they're meeting our criteria. We also, you know, we talked about trace register and all the information we collect. We're, we're constantly trying to be better. So now we're even adding a social compliancy element to this collection. So we're following up on that as well. Our team works really hard with doing monthly audits just to make sure that we're collecting all the right information and that information is accurate. So it's, we feel really proud about the products that we offer in our stores. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about you know, some global issues that we're addressing and, and how we're constantly working to um, um, do the right thing. But along those lines of doing the right thing, you know, we're also working with our, uh, with our local suppliers and figuring out how we can grow local seafood. Growing lo local seafood is extremely important to us. We know it's extremely important to our consumers and our communities. So. We um, have done a lot of work around um, 
increasing local awareness in our seafood department. So for example, last year we took, um, we made a decision to update our guardrails. So we have very specific local guardrails and we had to share these changes with our guardrails um, with amongst the supplier community. And so all of our local product is sourced from the Gulf of Maine and um, harvested from the Gulf of Maine and then produced within the Hannaford uh, footprint. And we worked again with GMRI to develop this, these guardrails and we do some extra vetting to make sure that it truly is, is local. So with that said, we're, um, we partner with our suppliers to find other ways to support local seafood and grow local seafood because it's really important to us to continue to support our communities. So again, you can see the little local tags or you can look for those in our seafood department and, and know that you're supporting local. And finally, there's many benefits to these types of programs and the programs that we've launched. Uh, and I think for me, the, the biggest benefit is that our customers can trust what we're doing, that you can trust what we're buying. You should not have to worry at night about if you're eating sustainable seafood or not, or if it was, um, if there's slave labor um, harvesting it or, or getting it out of the ocean. That's my job, that's Lee's job. And I would say 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the seafood buyers of the world didn't even know this stuff existed. And if they did, they were turning, turning a blind eye on it. And we don't do that anytime, anytime I've heard of anything in the industry, we go at it full force. And it might take us some time to address it because it's Asia, it's around the world, but we are addressing it. We're part of a seafood task force in um, Asia right now, which is helping with the social compliance issues. And, and it's one conversation at a time, it's one effort at a time, but we are very committed. And I'm, I am very proud of our organization for allowing us to be this committed and allowing people like Lee and myself and our peer at, at Food Lion, Josanna, um, to be this committed and loyal and, and not to turn a blind eye to the situations out there. So with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have some time for questions. Any questions for Kim and Lee? One of these lectures, I think, seafood. So the last time we did some research on this, I, I would say we, at the time when we first looked at it, it was probably 70, close to 70%, and don't quote me on that, that percentage, but it was like 70% and 30% local. When we first learned that, and that was probably two, couple of years ago, we really stepped up our focus on local. And to be honest, I haven't looked at that percentage most recently, but I know it's our local sales are growing. Um, I, I'm pretty proud of the, the efforts that our team has, has made to grow local and even our suppliers, they've been so willing to um, work with us to develop some programs that truly support local, local seafood. So I would say initially I was alarmed, but our, you can be guaranteed that our focus is on growing those, those local seafood sales. Yeah, and salmon is our number one, at least it was, um, it fin fish. Is. And that's also from Canada. So while it's not United States, we do have U.S. We have salmon out of, of Machias Port, and that's our local salmon. And then our commodity, what I call commodity salmon, so the Atlantic salmon, is out of Canada. So that's imported technically, but it is, I feel like, a, you know, a sister in com company in North America. So. Um, and then shrimp is really what puts that number over the top. The imported shrimp um, into the U.S. is just, it's, it's a crazy number. Um, and we buy, look, we do offer a, a East Coast shrimp or sometimes a Gulf shrimp. Mm -hmm. But those shrimp numbers are just, we sell a bunch of shrimp. Yes. The 
guardrails. <laughs> oh, it, it, <laughs> were you referring to the local guardrails yes. when I uh, spoke to those? That's, it's really the criteria, the definitions, uh, yeah. Hannaford terminology. <laughs> <laughs> That's our lingo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's really the, the definition, um, the definitions that we put in place for, for seafood. So we worked um, with the um, with GMRI to uh, sit, you know, we sat at a table and just really talked about what do we feel good about when we talk about local seafood. So it was a matter of where the product needs to be sourced, how it's processed, and um, so th there's a lot of industry definitions for, for um, local, but we wanted to be specific. And I would say our, our local seafood definition is probably one of the most specific definitions that exist. You won't find um, Chinese tilapia with a local label, even though it's locally produced and our guardrails in across the store is more about the production and supporting the people in the factories in our footprint but for seafood we and we had to get leadership buy-in that we we couldn't feel comfortable calling a tilapia local even though it was produced in you know in our footprint so there was there were some differences between us getting more strict just in the seafood arena on local we wanted to feel good that it was actually the, the fish swimming in the waters around us. Uh, is there one particular seafood item that you say has notably increased over the last few years, or at least, whether it be shellfish or fish? Anything that really stands out? I know what I would say, but I'm not the expert. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we uh, have focused on certain categories in, in our seafood counter. I mean, salmon has always been our number one commodity that we sell, but we did place a big effort on lobsters as well. So lobsters have, we've experienced a lot of growth with, with lobsters. Uh, we have been focusing on introducing other um, species, local species to our customers. and. Uh, I will say it's it can be more challenging than one would think. So, we've uh, we've we frequently promote a redfish in our case that is local. Uh, we we have our local Maine mussels that um, we're pretty proud of as well, and we're seeing growth within that category as well. Um, shellfish is is uh, we've actually been focusing on local oysters as well. Um, but that's, that's a, a segment of our business that has been challenging because I think most people go to restaurants to enjoy o oysters. So we're really trying to figure out where do we play in that, um, um, that world. So, um, but just curious if that's how you would have answered. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say the, um, the seafood or the salmon I mentioned out of Matthias mm -hmm. Port, that yeah. didn't, we didn't have that. We had an all natural salmon that we've had for years. And when I, Lee and Josanna bumped into figuring this out, but there's, pon, there's um, ponds or, or pens, 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 sorry, pens yeah. in Matthias Port. And all of that salmon that we sell that's local comes from those pins and are it's processed right there in Matthias Port. And the fun story about that is we have a store there that we backhaul, use to backhaul that truck that delivers to that store to mm -hmm. backhaul that salmon. So it's the carbon footprint on that salmon is mm -hmm. as low yeah. as you can absolutely get it. Um, so it's a really neat story. We don't we're not real good at telling our story to our customers, but it is a unique story to mm -hmm. to seafood, yeah. especially when you have seafood coming even from Canada down and. Mm -hmm you know, or, or shrimp from we, around the world. There's, there's actually another funny element to that story. And um, so we, we were actually testing a theory around what country of origin would resonate well with the consumer. So we, we had this internal battle where we heard Norwegian salmon might be better than Canadian salmon. And so we did a test. We, want, we asked our customers, what's most important to you? And, and actually, a customer said, well, we're aware of this local farm in Machias. Why aren't you buying from them? And we're like, that is a very good question. <laughs> so we, we made some contacts. And 
we reached out to them. We, we went to visit them. I think that was actually one of the pictures mm -hmm. up there. It was, there was the the three fest. of us. We, <laughs> we got to go out on a boat, visit the pens, and, and it's been a really great success story. So mm -hmm. it's salmon just continues mm -hmm. to do well. Hake is the other one, and um, this was before Lee was in seafood. Um, I was a seafood category manager, and Jen, you probably said something to me. Hey, let's try this hake, and I'm like, hake, what's hake? <laughs> <laughs> and hake was, I don't know, two ninety nine, three ninety nine a pound. It was dirt cheap, um, and we we started just slowly advertising it, bringing it in, and that hake business built up so fast, and then other retailers obviously saw that we were having success with it and they started doing it now hakes 6.99 7.99 mm -hmm. a pound because the supply and demand curve caught up with it but we were i think one of the first in the northeast to actually introduce hakes so we really do try to find underutilized species and share it with our customers some take off some don't <laughs> we have some of those stories too but um we, we, we do try them. We do, we do try and we try to get, educate the customer and, and educate our seafood counter managers to actually sell it and to talk to it so that customers know what they're buying. Um, but I, actually, Hake's one of my favorites now. So Pollock, we do sell, and we, we, we try to get behind Pollock, too. And it's, it's been one of, it does well when we promote it. So we try to create a, a regular cadence around promoting Pollock, but it's it's another, you know, it's it's you know we 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 know what our top sellers are. It's salmon, haddock, and cod. That's what we do. We sell the most of when we speak to um, thin fish. So Pollock, um, we we're really trying to figure out ways to educate the consumers on how to cook Pollock and prepare it. But it is something that we we stay very close and connected to as well. Um, you mentioned that you um, had to cut ties with certain suppliers. Are there any um, products or categories that you still have been unable to find as a um, So there's, so I would say where we spend the most effort when we look at um, sourcing tuna, there's a lot of fishing, um, fishery improvement projects with tuna, so we stay very close. We haven't had any issues, but we, we definitely have to make sure that we're um, looking um, closely at that. We have but gone out of octopus. We don't yeah. sell That's some tuna suppliers. Um, mm -hmm. We blocked tuna, away we from tuna mostly. Yeah, yeah, we yeah we've made some difficult decisions where you won't find certain brands on our shelf um, because of that. And um, octopus, we don't sell octopus, um, and we'll only work with um, suppliers who are supporting a fit for um, squid as well. So yeah, there's definitely species that we have walked away from, and then some we just make sure that we vet it before we source it from particular su suppliers. What's the biggest issue with octopus? I, I don't know. It's yeah, last lack of managed resources. Yeah, it's really the issue. There is a um, a pot catch method is is approved. So just finding suppliers who utilize that method um, is is challenging. I had a question in the back. I'm curious how the uh, consistency and sustainability has affected the bottom line. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good question, and I was very concerned when it was first introduced mm -hmm. to me. And I had suppliers all the time telling me, costs are going to be on the rise. I w there was a time in shrimp that there, there was not enough resources to get BAP two star. Um, and I'm sure it affected cost in some way, but it was minimal to where it, it really didn't affect the bottom line. I feel like over two years, we took it pretty slow. We gave it two years to get there, and we were talking, and it wasn't just us. We partnered um, with many retailers across the United States. So Kroger in Canada, Loblaws is on it, Sam's Club, Walmart, um, I think about 15 or even more large retailers. So we don't consider sustainability a competitive advantage. We felt like as an industry, we had to pull together and understand mm -hmm. the problem and go after it together. So we, we, um, we could talk freely with our competitors about what we were doing and we encouraged the mm -hmm. two-way dialogue. 
So um, because we were all pushing the industry at the same time, it made it a little, it moved faster than if it was just our organization. But um, that was the hard part. I, I remember talking to like our shrimp supplier and he's like, Kim, there's not enough product. And then I would have to go to like the um, certification groups and say, hey, my supplier's saying there's not enough product. One of us would go and you know ask a lot of questions and say, is there enough product? How, you know, how are we gonna get more product? And well, we don't have enough inspectors. Well, you guys need more inspectors. So we had to put even pressure on the people that were doing these certifications for us. But once the, once the, um, was that kind of, we got through that over those two years, I don't feel like just things started leveling themselves out, but we were all doing it at the same time. Jen. I would say, a, generally speaking, in the grocery industry, there's not enough women in leadership positions. And we, are, we at Hannaford are taking that very serious. Um, we, we work with our women who have aspirations to be leaders. We develop them. I, don't, I develop a lot of people, and not just women, but men and women. Mm -hmm. And um, we're very committed to getting women in leadership roles um, above mm -hmm. the manager position as well. I would say um, I brought Lee to seafood. For example, this is a <laughs> developmental opportunity for me tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, also Josanna, I've mentioned her a couple times. She, um, when I was um, promoted to a director at Food Lion or at Delhaize America, I brought Lee as to follow me. And it really wasn't intentional that it was women to women. I will say that these ladies have the same amount of passion that I do, and we have a, a, a passion that we've really pushed the industry. And I've shared many times with the industry and in large conferences that my philosophy was, I always thought of myself inside this big balloon, and I'm pushing on the walls of that balloon until it pops, and the industry is the balloon. And I told them I'm gonna push you as hard as I can without popping the balloon. And that was my philosophy through the years that I was really at Lee and Lee's seat, you know, pushing this effort. And um, I wouldn't give up. They were, there was no, it, if, there, if it was a no, my answer was how do we get to a yes and when are we going to do it? So it was a, a lot of tenacity. And I, I feel like um, our voice in the industry is what made the industry go at the pace that it did. And we, I mean, we showed up at conferences that we, even Del Hayes, we never went, we never went to Asia prior to that. Not to the, we might, they, they might have gone to the, the farms and stuff, but at conferences, we, we still sit in, in front of panels, in front of suppliers. There's 200 people in these, in the audience. And somebody mm -hmm. from DA or AD now, excuse me, actually, we usually have somebody from All Hold and also from Del Hayes on these panels. And we still share and we still push and we're not mm -hmm. done yet. I mean, we've done a lot, um, but we have more to, more to mm -hmm. do. We have aspirations to get BAP four star on all of our farm product. Um, so we're not done. Again, it's, it's continuing to push as hard as the industry will, can keep up with us. And then also the social compliance. I, after 2012, I switched real fast and hard to social compliance because I was hearing when I was at these conferences a lot of issues, and I, I wasn't okay with it. There was mm -hmm. nothing about it I was okay with, and I was going to make a difference. So I, I, I kind of switched efforts, continued to push on sustainability, but social responsibility I got hugely behind, which we could spend another half an hour on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're going to end it okay. there. Thank you to all of you for joining us, and um, please tell your friends about this lecture and that they can go to the GMRI website and hear it themselves and see it themselves, um, and hope you'll spread the word of GMRI in general. Uh, the, the way we 
advance as an organization is really through the support of people like you talking about what we do, and um, we appreciate all that you do in that respect. Um, if you aren't currently getting information about GMRI and you'd like it, um, Rachel will be outside after the lecture and you can sign up and say what you're interested in. And then finally, I um, want to thank our sponsors again, the Joan Morton Kelly Charitable Trust, which helps make this um, series uh, available. Um, we also count on people like you, and um, we do have envelopes out there if you'd like to contribute to um, our Compass uh, Fund. So again, thank you for coming. Thanks to Kim and Lee, and I uh, hope we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you.